Let's just bow our heads for a moment. Our Father in heaven, we're grateful for the Sabbath. That reminds us of your overarching power and grace and mercy and your great love for us in setting aside this time when we can be with you. We just pray tonight as we contemplate um, some of our history and try and see a little bit of it from your perspective that you would grant us that vision. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're tasked this evening with looking, uh, taking a look at the the Minneapolis Conference from God's Perspective. Now, this was a watershed moment for the Adventist Church. I don't think anyone's probably who's here hasn't heard that, or if you, certainly if you've been here for the last few days. But what did heaven experience in this time? When God looks down on this planet, what is he longing for? What are his plans? What is the divine purpose behind this teaching that we call the latter rain and this heartfelt message of the loud cry. The Bible depicts in various terms uh, the final message that God will give the world before his return. Different aspects of the message can be seen. The foundational message is righteousness by faith. You've heard these terms, the Laodicean remedies, the third angel's message, including the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, justification by faith, Righteousness by faith, the righteousness of Christ, and the loud cry, message of Revelation 18.1, and of course, the latter rain. We see different aspects, and we use different words, as some of the speakers have brought out. And we might say the overarching theme is righteousness by faith. We call it the 1888 message, or as Ellen White said, the most precious message. Two significant passages for early Adventists included Revelation chapters 14 and 18. There was this time predicted when the third angel's message would culminate in this loud cry in Revelation 18, and the earth would be lightened with the glory of God in what was described as the loud cry of the third angel's message under the latter rain power of the Holy Spirit. Revelation 18, 1, 2, and 4. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great power, or authority, and the earth was lightened or illuminated with his glory, and he cried mightily with a strong or loud voice, there's the loud cry, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. And then we have um, another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues, kind of mirroring Revelation 14. Ellen White uh, made this statement in in the eighth volume of the Testimonies, page 118, that uh, she says, as foretold in this 18th of Revelation, the third angel's message is proclaimed with great power by those who give the final warning against the beast and his image. I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power. She quotes that text. Uh, And then she says, this is the message given by God to be sounded forth in the loud cry of the third angel. God's purpose was that this message Uh, with its themes of justification by faith and the righteousness of Christ, was to go to the world. And the call for all, she says in this, she's writing to Uriah Smith. Uriah Uriah Smith was a a player in the 1888 saga, the historical saga. There were, you know, competing views of different things like the law in Galatians and the covenants and uh, even minor things like the horns, as uh, I think Brian mentioned. She says this, the message given us by A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner is the message of God to the Laodicean church. She says it's been sounding. Take it in all of its phases. Sound it forth to the people wherever providence opens the way. And I'm glad the providence is opening the way, not only in Romania, but also in Africa and various places we see this going forth now. But we're, right now we're back in 1888. So we're going to look at that. Justification by faith and the righteousness of Christ are the themes to be presented to a perishing world. Oh, that you might open the door of your heart to Jesus. Um, Sometimes we focus on the kind of the thematic or the theological language, but notice that last phrase. Oh, that you might open the heart, door of your heart to Jesus, because we might have a message, but if he doesn't have our heart, 
We don't really have a message. We don't have an operational message. There's a preparation that's needed to give the loud cry. We need, according to the Laodicean mission, message, we need vision, we need character, and we need covering. All of those things. Ellen White would confirm, of course, the connection between the third angel's message and righteousness by faith. You've seen this, if you were here earlier, you've seen this uh, statement, you may have read it before. Several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message, and I have answered it is the third angel's message in verity. It's the, it's the loud cry of the fourth angel to go to the world. She says the time of test is just upon us, for the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin pardoning redeemer. This is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. That's in reference to the fourth angel of Revelation 18, 1. But who is this sin pardoning redeemer? And we might ask, what especially are the sins that need to be pardoned? Uh, Fred mentioned uh, Ellen White had an angel, a guide, who would uh, often speak to her. And uh, he was speaking to her in 1886. She said, the, the, the guide, this is the angel speaking, there is much light yet to shine forth from the law of God and the gospel of righteousness. We've heard about the law and the gospel going hand in hand. This message understood in its true character and proclaimed in the spirit will lighten the earth with its glory. The closing work of the third angel's message will be attended with a power that will send the rays of the Son of Righteousness into all, all the highways and byways of life. Um, many different aspects of the message mentioned in this one statement. But what are these healing rays of the Son of Righteousness? And what is it especially that needs healing or needed healing at that time. 31 years before the 1888 conference, Ellen White had a vision of what God had in mind. And this was the, this is 1857, the shaking, Review and Herald, December 31, 1857. I heard those clothed with the armor speak forth the truth in great power. I asked what had made this great change. An angel answered, it is the latter rain the refreshing from the presence of the Lord, the loud cry of the third angel. So before we talk about God's experience in 1888, we want to look at God's expectations for 1888. And this was part of his expectation. Ellen White had many of these statements which connected the loud cry um, and the latter rain. So they're, they're connected, and she almost talks about them interchangeably. So you may hear some talk about, well, the loud cry began, but we don't have the latter rain yet. She links them together, and, uh, but we need to not forget that. But both the loud cry and the latter rain are a refreshing from the Lord. And we might ask, in good Jewish fashion, what needs to be refreshed? What is it that needs refreshing? And you're familiar, hopefully, with this statement. The Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through elders Jones and Wagner. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith in the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice, or there's the loud cry, and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in a large measure. There's the latter rain. So this link of the 1880 message, the loud cry and the latter rain. This was to bring the great controversy to an end. This was to wrap things up. But before the loud cry can go to the world, God's people must themselves be ready. And as a body, often called the bride, in scripture and in the spirit of prophecy, be united with the heavenly bridegroom in his purposes and in his message. 
or they can't give the message, or worse yet, they'll be lost. We cannot be ready to meet the Lord by waking when the cry is heard, behold the bridegroom. What's she talking about here? It's a parable, right? Also an actual event. If you read the Christ's object lessons, Christ is actually looking up and he's seeing a wedding and he's seeing this story unfold, is the way Ellen White tells it. But we can't wait until the cry comes, behold the bridegroom, and then gather up our empty lamps to have them replenished. We cannot keep Christ apart from our lives here and yet be fitted for his companionship in heaven. This is a relational statement. It's not a, so much a theological statement, but it is, it's a deep theological statement, but you see it's relational foundation. What is it that delays the loud cry? Is it a theology? Is it an experience? So I want us to look a little bit at the 1888 history from the perspective of the heavenly bridegroom, if we can, for a few moments. We tend to think of the loud cry in the latter rain as the source of power for the church to give the end time message. But this, the power of this message is first to um, change the heart of the bride to want to be with the bridegroom, to, to work with the bridegroom to be in intimate union with the bridegroom. So before the 1888 conference, we could say the heavenly bridegroom was anticipating getting to be with his bride. This power, it's interesting, if you look in, um, well, let's read this. When the mighty angel descends from heaven clothed with the panoply of heaven, and gives strength to the third angel, the power of the message is felt by them. The heavenly showers fall on them, the latter rain drops in their vessels. So we have this idea of the latter rain and power. But this word panoply, have you you familiar with what that word means in Scripture? Uh, it's a full suit of armor, a magnificent or impressive array, a splendid display. And if you look, we won't read it now, but if you look in the Song of Solomon, you're familiar with the story of Solomon coming to get his bride. And it's, it's this kind of picture. It's, there's this, he's made this wonderful uh, conveyance. He has all these uh, soldiers with him. And there's this panoply. There's this, this power and protection that is there for the purpose of coming to get the bride and have her feel so secure that she's ready to join him. The Spirit of Prophecy uses this word panoply about 60 times. Uh, here's one in Councils to Teachers, page 52. Linked to the inf infinite one, man is made partaker of the divine nature. Upon him the shafts of evil have no effect, for he is clothed with the panoply of Christ's righteousness. So this message of Christ's righteousness was meant to be a protection, an armored protection that the bridegroom was bringing to the bride, this, this protection. What was the bridegroom anticipating in 1888? To the mind of Jesus, the gladness of the wedding festivities pointed forward to the rejoicing of that day when he shall bring home his bride to the Father's house. And the redeemed with the Redeemer shall sit down to the marriage supper of the Lamb, he says, as the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, but thou shalt be called my delight. For the Lord delighteth in thee. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. You thought you had a good time tonight singing. What's that going to be like when Jesus rejoices over us with singing? He himself is the bridegroom. The bride is the church of which, as his chosen one, he says, Thou art all fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. Talk about the faith of Jesus. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. 
He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. Isaiah 61.10. We see, we see this picture of a bridegroom and a bride uh, several places in Scripture. I mentioned the Song of Solomon, Song of Songs. Uh, there's passages in Isaiah. There's Hosea. And then there's one in Ezekiel. We might call it the backstory of the bride and groom, bride and bridegroom. Uh, in Ezekiel 16, we're, we're told, of course, that all of these things are written for our admonition on whom the ends of the world have come. And I don't know if Taylor Bunch had ever decided to tackle Ezekiel 16, what he would have done, like he did with, you know, 40 years in type and antitype. But, and we're not going to dwell on the middle of, of Ezekiel 16. We're going to talk a little bit about the beginning, and then we're going to talk about the history, and you can maybe start to make some applications. In many of these bridegroom and bride passages, there's an interruption of what God desires, what the bridegroom desires and expects. Um, here's Ezekiel 16. Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations and say, Thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, Your birth and your nativity are from the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. I don't think this is pejorative. It's just when God finds his people, they're basically pagan. He needs to bring them out of pagan worship and to appreciate him for who he is. As for your nativity, on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed in water to cleanse you. You were not rubbed with salt or wrapped in swaddling cloths. No eye pitied you to do any of these things for you, to have compassion on you. But you were thrown out into the open field when you yourself were loathed on the day you were born. When was Adventism born? When was the Seventh-day Adventist church born? <clears throat> In the aftermath of 1844. Um, do you see the, maybe a parallel there and how people looked on this movement early on? And when I passed by you and saw you struggling in your own blood, I said to you, in your blood, live. Yes, I said to you, in your blood, live. I made you thrive like a plant in the field, and you grew, matured, and became very beautiful. Your breasts were formed, your hair grew, but you were naked and bare. When I passed by you again and looked upon you, indeed, your time was the time of love. So I spread my wing over you and covered your nakedness. Yes, I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you, and you became mine, says the Lord God. Then I washed you in water. Yes, I thoroughly washed off your blood, and I anointed you with oil. You see this cleansing, this healing, this um, bringing the, the blessings of the truths of God, who he is, what he's like, the whole great controversy theme. You see God bringing to his church, his bride, and clothing her, providing her with all these valuable things, and covenanting that he would bring this message to its completion. It goes on. I clothed you in embroidered cloth and gave you sandals of badger skin. I suppose that's the um, expensive shoes of the day. I clothed you with fine linen and covered you with silk. I adorned you with ornaments, put bracelets on your wrists and a chain on your neck. And I put a jewel in your nose, earrings in your ears, beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver. Your clothing was of fine linen, silk, and embroidered cloth. You ate pastry of fine flour, honey, and oil. You were exceedingly beautiful and succeeded to royalty. Your fame went out among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect through my splendor, which I had bestowed on you, says the Lord God. This is what he had done for Israel. What has he done for us as a movement? Is there anything valuable in Adventism that wasn't the gift of God? I can't think of anything. This crown of royalty, you know, who has hospitals all over the world? Who has educational systems all over the world? Who has a view of God's character that's better than any other um, denomination? Who has a message that um, is true? We've been blessed. But if we look, and we won't read them tonight, like I said, but if, if you read the verses that follow in Ezekiel, 
Uh, it's a story of desire by the bride for anything and everything but the bridegroom. She's happy to have all of the things that the bridegroom has given her. But rather than accept the three, free gift of, of intimate connection and love with her bridegroom, she would rather, if you read it, the Lord is amazed. He's saying, you're, you're different. You know, you want to pay for this. She's out there paying for love, what she thinks is love. Um, so you can see a connection with righteousness by faith and righteousness by works, right? I mean, righteousness by faith is everything we have and are is a gift from God. Righteousness by works is, no, some part of this is my contribution. I'm of value. You know, I'm providing something of value to this. And she takes it that to the extreme, of course. Um, God had raised up this movement from nothing to be, and prepared it to be his bride. This controversy in 1888 was fundamentally over righteousness by faith versus righteousness by works. Well, we look at Pentecost um, as perhaps a precursor for what was supposed to happen in 1888, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. She says this, when the Spirit was poured out from on high, the church was flooded with light, but Christ was the source of that light. His name was on every tongue. His love filled every heart. This was the, the early bride, if you will. He was anticipating a union, as we see here. So it will be when the angel that comes down from heaven, having great power, shall lighten the whole earth with his glory. That is, love filling every heart. It requires heavenly oil to have the lamps lighted to meet the bridegroom. What does it mean to get this light? Uh, if you heard uh, our talk last year, the golden oil is faith and love. When the latter rain comes upon the people of God, you must have a preparation to press right on because those whose vessels are clean whose hands are free just when that latter rain comes, get the light that comes from on high. Their voices are lifted, everyone to proclaim commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. When James White was dying, Ellen White was promised that the Lord would raise up others to take his place and bring in an element to the work that had been missing. I think someone mentioned earlier today that James White had, he had, had this sense that the Lord needed to bring another element into the work. Ellen White also began to write more earnestly from about 1882 on, encouraged the church to get ready for the latter rain and, and warn, warn them of dangers. She said this, you probably heard this statement, a revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. We have far more to fear from within than from without. The hindrances to strength and success are far greater from the church itself than from the world. And we might apply it personally. That is, we're members of the church and we tend to think, well, there are great dangers in the church because of this, but we might take it personally as well. Where are our greatest dangers? Within or without? There is nothing that Satan fears so much that the people of God shall clear the way by removing every hindrance so that the Lord can pour out his spirit upon a languishing church and an impenitent congregation. If Satan had his way, there would never be another awakening, great or small, to the end of but she says, when the way is prepared for the Spirit of God, the blessing will come. Satan can no more hinder a shower of blessing from descending upon God's people than he can close the windows of heaven that rain cannot come upon the earth. Did you get rained on today? It seemed natural, right? Nothing could stop it coming down unless you had an umbrella. Well, in the summer of 1888, before the Minneapolis conference, Ellen White had quite an impressive dream. <clears throat> in fact, this dream was so impressive, she got sick for two weeks. She was in an assembly when a man of noble, majestic stature came in, took his position on the platform, unrolled something which looked like several long leaves fastened together. He turned the pages, his hand ran down the, ran down the page, his eyes swept over the congregation, and then... He would turn them from right to left and she could see what was on there. There was names, there was characters, there were sins of every description. And she gives a list, selfishness, envy, pride, jealousy, 
evil surmising, hypocrisy, licentiousness, hatred, and murder in the heart because of this envy and jealousy. These sins were right among the ministers and people. So if you look at the bride, how ready is she to enter into the love of the bridegroom? Well, how was this? And a voice said that the time had come when the work in heaven is all activity for the inhabitants of this world. The time had come when the temple and its worshipers had to be measured. The bridegroom is anticipating his bride getting ready. All heaven is stirred. She had another dream years later in which there was an angel measuring the people, uh, determining whether they had received the Holy Spirit and whether they had on the wedding garment. So she thought she was going to die after this. Um, she had great drops of perspiration on her brow. She felt paralyzed. And she was incapacitated for about two weeks. But the Lord raised her up and sent her to Minneapolis. And she wrote to the delegates um, ahead of time saying this, we are impressed that this gathering will be the most important meeting you've ever attended. All selfish ambition should be laid aside and you should plead with God for his spirit to descend upon you as it came upon the disciples who were assembled together upon the day of Pentecost. Well, she took a train to Minneapolis leaving on October 2 and arrived in time for the start of the, of the uh, the ministerial um, meetings on October 10. She was told later by her heavenly messenger that God had raised her up that she might stand at her post of duty at the 1888 General Conference. Evidence suggests that if she had not been there, Jones and Wagner and their most precious message would not have, that this message would not have survived the meeting and we would not enjoy it today. So when we want to see how heaven felt about this, heaven had a messenger previously recognized by the delegates to this conference that was expressing heaven's feelings about what was happening. She says, I told them plainly that the position and work God gave me at that conference was disregarded by nearly all. Rebellion was popular. Their course was an insult to the Spirit of God. The Lord sustained me by his Holy Spirit and told me that my work was to stand in my position of trust to do the work the Lord had sent me to do and raise me up from a bed of sickness to do it. And his sustaining power would be with me. His everlasting arms were beneath me. It's a beautiful picture. When we talk about 1888, uh, we need to tread softly. We need to be honest about our past, but also careful lest we repeat the same mistakes. We're not deciding who repented and is going to heaven and who's not. That's not really our purpose. What we want to do is recognize what was going on, the principles that were happening, and how we might be responsible for some of the same, same things. Well, on Wednesday, October 10, the Ministerial Institute began at 2.30 in the afternoon and went for seven days. Then the General Conference followed on October 17, and then lasted until November 4 in 1888. The attendees numbered perhaps as many as 500, including 96 delegates representing 27,000 church members around the world. First, there was the Ministerial Institute, and Ellen White would speak nearly 20 times to those gathered in the church there. We only have 11 of those um, available, I think, now, maybe up to 15. She says, as we have assembled here, we want to make the most of our time, but we too often let opportunities slip away, and we do not realize the benefit from them, which we should. If we ever needed the Holy Spirit to be with us, if we ever needed to preach in the demonstration of the Spirit at its, this very time, the baptism of the Holy Spirit will come upon us at this very meeting, if we will have it so. So here's, here's God giving the message of what he wants, what he desires. He says, let us commence right here in this meeting and not wait until the meeting is half through. We want the Spirit of God here now. We need it. And we want it to be revealed in our characters. 
And I think that's a, a good prayer for us even now. Now, brethren, I have felt one of the most solemn burdens ever since I have returned from Europe. And I will tell you, as I told my friends in Oakland, I feel horribly afraid to come into our conference. I have been at night, awake night after night with a sense of agony for the people of God that the sweat would roll off from me. Some things fearfully impressive were presented to me. And then she told of this vision that we had read part of. So she read these remarks to the delegates expressing the fear. Now, why, why was she afraid? Well, there was this controversy over the law in Galatians. Um, the Lord wanted to give the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of righteousness by faith to his people. But there was an argument that broke out about the law in Galatians. And some of this has been discussed earlier. And of course, we're going to study it probably in the Sabbath school lesson, especially if you um, get those books that were recommended from the bookstore about this. Galatians 3.24, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So Uriah Smith, George Butler, and the majority of Adventists believed at this time that this text referred to the ceremonial law only. Jones and Wagner had been teaching for two years that the schoolmaster primarily represented the Ten Commandments, which were to bring us to see our need of Christ. Christ was our great need. Now, Butler was so upset that he, he became sick from the mental stress and stayed home from the conference. But he still sent Ellen White a 39-page letter to let her know what he thought. And she responded on Sunday the 14th with a 20-page letter of her own and then made these assessments. The spirit and the influence of the ministers generally who have come to this meeting is to discard light. From this night's work, there will arise false imaginings, cruel and unjust misunderstandings that will work like leaven in every church and close hearts to the striving of the Spirit of God. The influence of this meeting will be as far-reaching as eternity. This is the result of controversy. What was underlying this controversy? There was a spirit of debate that had been cultivated as Adventists got these truths of the Sabbath and the state of the dead and other, all these doctrines. And we're trying to convince their brother, brethren and sisters in the other churches. So when Jones and Wagner arrived at the church on the opening day, there was this blackboard in the front and it had something like this on it. J.H. Morrison, one of the ministers had written this and signed his name, resolved that the law in, the, in Galatians is the ceremonial law, and then he wanted Wagner to sign on the other side and, and uh, set off the debate. It's almost like drawing your guns for the duel, you know? Let's, let's do this. But Wagner refused to sign it. He said he didn't come to debate. Furthermore, his point was that we do not get righteousness by the law, but by faith, irrespective of whether it be the moral or ceremonial law. Many of the ministers had trained as debaters and had conducted their evangelistic um, meetings in that style. So G.B. Starr, who spent 10 years with Ellen White in Australia, told this story. There was this minister, J.H. Morrison, who had written this down. He um, says, four of us were here in the tent in Oskaloosa, Iowa. And this uh, minister was walking around the tent and a stranger entered the tent. He appeared to me as one of the finest looking men I've ever seen. He was over six feet tall, well proportioned, had such a kindly expression on his face. So the minister invited him to be seated. And us two young men listened with interest to the conversation. At first, this minister replied to the stranger's questions in a kindly spirit. This man was asking questions. But soon assumed, that's Morrison, assumed a debating controversial attitude. We saw no reason for this as the stranger manifested such a good, sweet spirit of interested inquiry and offered no objections. After about an hour of such conversation, the stranger arose in all his dignity and addressing the minister said, you are no minister of Jesus Christ. You are a controversialist, controversialist, sir. 
Instead of the minister realizing that he had been properly rebuked, he instead chuckled and laughed and said, oh, you can't meet the argument. The stranger made no reference to this, but repeated again, word for word, his statement. Again, the minister laughed, and the third time the stranger repeated, you are no minister of Jesus Christ, you are a controversialist. Sir, I bid you good day. And out of the tent door he walked. Unfortunately, um, sorry about the picture disappearing there, but Morrison didn't listen, even to what Ellen White said was an angel. Because... Um, G.B. Starr tells this story, talking to Ellen White, asking her, um, or telling the, her the story, and she said, why, Brother Starr, that was an angel of God. Was it, I inquired. How did you know? How did I know? Why, well, I gave that message to that brother at the Minneapolis conference and told him that the Lord had sent an angel to rebuke him for his controversial manner of labor. Are you ever tempted to enter into controversy with someone over righteousness by faith? There was considerable heckling of Wagner and Jones. So not only a debating spirit, but also a animus toward the person. Um, and what do we call those ad hominem attacks in Latin where we see it a lot in politics today, right? People don't want to talk about the issues they would attack the person. Although E.J. Wagner was short, he could be plainly heard. However, because of his stature, someone called out tauntingly, we can't see you. The thrust was made to hurt him, and it did. That's from Leroy Froome, Movement of Destiny. Um, he was probably not more, much more than five feet tall. So when Morrison uh, went to present at these meetings, he took a debative style, very polemic in nature. Uh, he maintained that we had always believed and taught justification by faith. He contended the subject had been overstressed at the conference, and he was fearful that the law might lose the important place that belonged to it. Thus, the real fight in the Institute, wrote A.T. Jones years later in 1921, came over righteousness by faith. Brother Wagner led in the studies on that. Elder Morrison was chosen by the General Conference folks to lead the opposition, and he did it. And it was righteousness by anything and everything else than faith. Well, you see, Jones hadn't lost his pointedness years later. But this is his memory of what was happening. Well, how did Jones and Wagner choose to respond? They responded, we're told, in the spirit of Christ. What they did was they stood up front, side by side, with open Bibles, alternating in the reading of 16 Bible passages, primarily from the books of Romans and Galatians. Let's study our Sabbath school lessons, shall we? This and next quarter. This was their only answer. Without a word of comment, they took their seats. During the entire time of the readings, there was a hushed stillness over the vast assembly. This is R.T. Nash's eyewitness report of what he saw. When Brother Wagner, Ellen White, responded to this controversy, um, eventually, and this is uh, what she recalled or what she described. When Brother Wagner brought out these ideas, the matchless charms of Christ, the bridegroom, in Minneapolis, it was the first clear teaching on this subject from any human lips I had heard, accepting the conversations between myself and my husband. And what another presented it, every fiber of my heart said, Amen. Anybody's heart's been warmed to say amen, amen hearing this message? So it was clear to Ellen White that the real issue wasn't the law in Galatians. It was a new framework for this truth to be put in. She used this language elsewhere a new framework for old truths. And the new framework was the message of the righteousness of Christ or righteousness by faith. And it was meant to be a message grounded in and cultivating a certain personal experience, not simply a theoretical um, exercise. In fact, we're told by people who were there that Ellen White would sit in the front row when Wagner was presenting. And when Morrison got up, to speak, she would walk out. Um, 
R.T. Nash, in 1955, remembered that Ellen White was behind Jones and Wagner 100%, as he says here. Well, back to the Ministerial Institute for a moment, which actually preceded the, the conference. Uh, six days into this institute, Ellen White asked a serious question. Uh, she makes an assertion here. She says, it's high time that we were awake out of sleep, that we seek the Lord with all the heart, and I know he will be found of us. I know that all heaven is at our command. Just as soon as we love God with all our hearts and our neighbors ourselves, God will work through us. How shall we stand in the time of the latter rain? We think of the latter rain as, as something that brings power and opportunity, but like a river, a powerful river that is flowing. If the river's in its banks, it's a beautiful thing. If the river is not contained or flowing in the way that it's designed to flow, it becomes a very dangerous thing. And when the latter rain falls, we need a preparation. Um, so she says, how shall we stand in the time of the latter rain? Who expects to have a part in the first resurrection? You have been cherishing sin and iniquity in the heart. You will fail in that day. Heaven is ready. Heaven is eager. But without a responsive love, where the covenant is written on the heart and mind, who can stand? How can a marriage take place with his bride if she is not prepared? If she's out in idolatrous relationships with things of the world? Let us with contrite hearts pray most earnestly that now, in the time of the latter rain, the showers of grace may fall upon us. So she's saying it started, but it's obvious from the previous statement, it's not in its fullness. We need to be ready for this. But she said the time of the latter rain had come. So clearly 1888 was the time when the message of the latter rain was coming. She says, we have little time in which to work. We need to stop complaining about each other Amen? Amen? And lay our whole hearts open before God that we may receive the Holy Spirit. Amen. Years ago, she wrote in 1899, the time came for the Holy Spirit to descend in a special manner upon God's earnest self-sacrificing workers. And I think, well, we'll see. God has a plan. There's hope. Uh, George Starr said Ellen White, she was, he was uh, talking about what she had said, what he had heard her say. She says, we've been in the time of the latter rain since the Minneapolis meeting. And that's um, in A.T. Jones' Third Angel's Message, number 16, the General Conference Bulletin, 1893. So Jones is quoting Starr and what Ellen White had told him. Uh, he became an Adventist in 1876, was ordained in 1879, worked in Chicago in the 1880s until 1891, and then he actually went and spent 10 years with Ellen White, Australia. And he was one who received a rich blessing at Minneapolis. He said, it was my privilege to attend the general conference at Minneapolis, Minnesota. There the subject of righteousness by faith was emphasized as it had never been before been among SDA ministers. So he, he was a minister. He had had experience. He, he knew what was out there. Sister White was present and daily through influence in decided words with the presentation of the subject. She stated that this marked the beginning of the latter rain and a loud cry. Well, the general conference began. This is the first morning of the meeting. Ellen White is speaking. Brethren and sisters, there is great need at this time of humbling ourselves before God that the Holy Spirit may come upon us. May God help us that his spirit may be made manifest among us. We should not wait until we go home to obtain the blessing of heaven. And neither should we. Those who have been long in the work have been far too content to wait for the showers of the latter rain to revive them. We should seek to have our actions of such a character that we will not shrink from having our Savior look upon them. Christ is here this morning. Angels are here. They're measuring the temple of God and those who worship therein. So she's connecting that vision she had earlier with what was happening that day. She says, the history of this meeting will be carried up to God for a record of every meeting is made 
the spirit manifested, the words spoken, the actions performed, noted in the books of heaven, transferred as faithfully as our features to the polished plate of the artist. Um, there's a better than digital image of everything. But she, this is what she is describing that heaven is sensing. Here I want to tell you what a terrible thing it is if God gives light and it is impressed on your heart and spirit for you to do as they, that is the Jews, did. God will withdraw his spirit unless his truth is accepted. We can fast forward during the conference that, you know, this controversy went on. There were other things happening, which we'll get to in a moment. But Ellen White, it got so bad that in a, on October 24, I think it was, that evening after she spoke this, she was going to leave. She says, now our meeting is drawing to a close and not one confession has been made. There's not been a single break so as to let the Spirit of God in. Now I was saying, what was the use of our assembling here together and of our ministering brethren to come in if they are here only to shut out the Spirit of God from the people? So heaven's perspective on what was happening is pretty clear. What is the reason the Spirit of God does not come into our meetings? It's because we have built a barrier around us. Is it because we have built a barrier around us? I speak decidedly because I want you to realize where you're standing. And that is a question, as we look back at the conference, that we can ask ourselves today. What, what are our barriers to the Holy Spirit? So here we can go back to Song of Solomon for a moment. And uh, I think Elder Wheeland quoted this text in one of his presentations years ago. This, you remember the Shulamite is sleeping, her heart's awake, she hears her beloved saying, open for me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one, for my head is covered with dew, my locks with the drops of the night. Sounds like water, right? Latter rain, this kind of picture. She responds, I have taken off my robe. Well, there's something there, isn't there? Who, who gave her the robe? Why did she take it off? How can I put it on again? I've washed my feet. How can I defile them? Who washed the disciples' feet? Jesus did. I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and was gone. My heart leaped up when he spoke. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. So we hear, see here in a, um, a short passage this experience of a bridegroom who's calling for his bride. She's not ready. I, I can't come. I can't open the door. And he actually leaves. And then she's out looking for him. And there are consequences when we reject what heaven is offering us or giving us. The bridegroom was at the door of the heart but was rebuffed. Why was he rebuffed? Why do we rebuff him? Ellen White uh, came out clearly. She didn't leave. The angel told her to stand at her post of duty. She had been placed there for a purpose. She was there to be um, the representative, if you will, of the bridegroom. She was there. So here's G.B. Starr again. It was our privilege to attend this meeting and daily to listen to Sister White as she unqualifiedly endorsed the powerful and convincing presentation of this vital subject from the books of Romans and Galatians he said, morning after morning, Sister White would reveal the words and conversations of individuals spoken in their private compartments. So she was exercising the prophetic gift that God had given her. God was revealing to her what was going on behind the scenes. And it was clear proof, he says here, never was clearer proofs, were clearer proofs given to an assembly that the Lord was speaking. Well, what happened when she endorsed what Jones had, you know, there's this controversy and Ellen White took sides, or the Lord through Ellen White said, well, these guys are right. Um, here's what a Westfall, F.H. Westfall said. He said, I will relate what I remember. Um, Sister White earnestly appealed to the conference to accept the message of righteousness by faith. 
She said she was carried in vision from room to room, and you see the same description. But here's what they were saying about Ellen White, the bridegroom's representative. She was growing old and getting childish. The young men, Jones and Wagner, had her under their thumb, and it influenced her to uphold them in what they were teaching. And I guess I want to be careful how I say this, but even today, when the message of righteousness by faith is resisted and rejected, I've had experiences where people, they, they say they respect the spirit of prophecy, but there are clear endorsements and messages from the, from the Lord's prophet that are ignored or, or placed in conflict with other, apparent conflict with other statements that she makes. So other things were said, uh, laughing and joking, disgusting comments, no spirit of solemnity. Um, this man, McReynolds, confessed um, that he lost his bearings and had united in this spirit to some degree. He said for two weeks, as Sister White has said, there was not a vocal prayer offered in the house. No praying. Uh, he had before made this humble confessions um, to uh, Ellen White, which he repeated at the meeting. D.E. Robinson says, So far was the feeling carried that a spirit of levity and sarcasm was manifest among many of the older workers against Jones and Wagner. But the most serious feature of the disaffection was the fact that because Sister White urged the importance of the message of righteousness by faith, and because thereby she upheld these brethren, it grew into a spirit of rejection of the testimonies of Sister White. Elder Wagner was Sister White's pet, was a common remark. I, I don't know if you sense um, what's happened in our church with respect for the spirit of prophecy. Do you see where the roots of this are? Yeah. So Robinson remembered this, not just because it was talked about. He was there. So Ellen White's response to what was going on, imagine how painful this was. You know, we talked about, somebody talked earlier today about guilt and shame. This is kind of shaming behavior that's going on, you know. Um, she says, I never felt more decidedly the spirit of the Lord moving upon me than at that meeting. And I know the angels of the Lord were standing by my side to help me. I seem to live as in a clear light of the son of righteousness. Amen. But the spirit that prevailed at that meeting was not the spirit of God. I had to bear a decided testimony against the spirit that prevailed. But my testimony was treated with indifference as idle tales. I was charged with being influenced by my son, W.C. White, Elder A.T. Jones, and A. Wagner. So again, she, she gives this testimony of the conversation, excitement of feelings, Smart, sharp, witty remarks. Um, servants whom the Lord had sent were caricature, ridicule, and place in a ridiculous light. And I encourage you, if you have not read Return of the Latter Rain and Wounded in the House of His Friends, that Ron Duffield, who actually prepared many of these slides um, and shared them with me, that he wrote these books and very clearly set out the differing pictures of what happened, the perceptions, the, the historical um, spin, if you will, of what was going on. But I think it's clear from what we've seen what heaven's, what God's <laughs> experience was here. She says, I was listening in the different rooms to the sarcastic remarks on Christian comments, the excitable, exaggerated statements made all because there was a difference in the views of the law in Galatians. And I think we need to be careful today, even as we discuss righteousness by faith, the law in Galatians, legal justification, any, any hot button word, things can be explained. I think Jones and Wagner had it right. If you want to really answer a controversialist, go to the scripture. And the less of human construct and idea, and the more of God's word, the better. 
The enemy had things very much his own way. I heard no word of prayer, but I heard my name mentioned in a slurring, criticizing way. I don't know, I'm just trying to think of other, were there Old Testament prophets that had this experience? The Lord would carry them around and they could hear what everybody else was saying about them. Maybe Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. Ellen White was in a, yes, a privileged position, but a painful privileged position. She later referred back to this event, said, and if they judge me of me in this light, fired with a zeal that is certainly is from beneath, they have thought and said worse things of Brethren Jones and Wagner. I shall never, I think, be called to stand under the direction of the Holy Spirit as I stood at Minneapolis. The presence of Jesus was with me. All assembled in that meeting and had an opportunity to place themselves on the side of truth by receiving the Holy Spirit, which was sent by God in such a rich current of love and mercy. But there was this response of ridicule, criticism, jeering, and laughter. And the manifestations of the Holy Spirit were attributed to fanaticism. Never before have I seen among our people such firm self-complacency and unwillingness to accept and acknowledge light as was manifested in Minneapolis. Go back in your mind to this picture of the bride in Ezekiel. She's got everything. Her bridegroom has outfitted her with beautiful clothing, you know, jewelry, sandals. Uh, he's, he's done everything to make her ready for the wedding. And... Uh, She's gone off after pagan ideas. She'd rather have a pagan theology than righteousness by faith. The whoredom of Babylon and her sisters. My testimony was ignored, and never in my life experience was I treated at that conference. I tell you, the work of God has given me to do has not suffered and is not likely to suffer half as much from open opposers as from my apparent friends those who appear to be defenders of the testimonies, but are their real assailants who weaken them and make them of none effect. I think that might happen to the messages of Jones and Wagner, too. It certainly has happened. Um, I'm glad to see all of you here, and I, I pray that the Spirit will impress each of us to dig, as I said, more into these messages in this quarter and the following quarter in the Sabbath school lessons. The night after I decided not to remain longer in Minneapolis, in a dream or vision of the night, a person of tall, commanding appearance brought me a message. He said, For this work the Lord has raised you up. His everlasting arms are beneath you. We read that before. From this meeting, the decisions will be made for life or death. Not that anyone need perish but spiritual pride and self-confidence will close the door that Jesus and his Holy Spirit's power shall not be admitted. So you, hear, you see the door? Bridegroom's at the door. But they shall have another chance. To be undeceived and to repent, confess their sins and come to Christ and be converted that he shall heal them. I don't know of a modern bridegroom who would come back to a bride that had gone off like the bride in Ezekiel. I wouldn't. But here, the Lord is saying they will have another chance. The Lord told her, no, not so. The angel stood by. God has a work for you to do in this place. The people are acting over the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. It is not you they are despising, but the messengers and the message I send to my people. Unless every soul shall repent of their sin, this their sin, this unsanctified independence that is doing insult to the Spirit of God, they will walk in darkness. They would not that God would manifest his spirit and his power, for they have a spirit of mockery and disgust in my word. Okay, how many of you, before you were married and you were faced with the commitment of the relationship, felt like you might not want to lose your independence? There are stories I could tell. 
but I won't. I remember when I was a teenager and thinking about giving my life to Christ that I had that same feeling. You know, this is my identity. This is who I am. Uh, what do you mean, surrender to this outside entity? You know, humanity recoils at this thought. So none of us are immune from this response. Ellen White um, writes here, I attended the meeting at Minneapolis. The history of that meeting has passed into eternity with its burden of record. And when the judgment shall sit and the book shall be opened, there will be found registered a history that many who are at that meeting will not be pleased to meet. But we just read that they would be given another chance. God in his great mercy has not just sent the message once. He's keeping it alive for you and me. She said, this meeting has been the saddest experience of my life. The position and work God gave me at that conference was disregarded by nearly all. Rebellion was popular. Their course was an insult to the Spirit of God. And Christ was wounded in the house of his friends. Zechariah 13.6, title of one of Ron's books. But this is a very personal, painful rejection felt by Christ himself, the spurned bridegroom. So if you've ever been in love and you've poured out your heart and your soul into someone's, you want to bless them, you want to be with them, and they say, eh, nah, I don't think so. It's very painful. But if they they laugh and mock and say, ah, you're, you know, you? This is the kind of picture we get. We wanted a different Christ than the one who is the bridegroom. There were very different impressions of the meetings. Some said it was the most profitable. Others said it was the most unfortunate. Um, F.H. Westfall went back to Plainsfield, Wisconsin, told the church that the latter rain had started. And one of the farmers sold his farm, put his money into the Lord's work, took up canvassing was ordained to the ministry. Some were truly blessed. G.B. Starr, again, says, Our souls were refreshed with the water of life. Our spirits rejoiced in Jesus as our personal, all-sufficient Savior. His person, his love, his righteousness, and his power to save to the uttermost were exalted as I have never heard them in any preceding conference. So there's a link between the bride, the church, and the bride, us, or the virgins, or the bridesmaids, I mean, whatever you want to take the analogy. But the church at large is not going to be ready until there's a, an experience in the, in the members. And that's you and me. It speaks to me. He continues, at that meeting, a statement was made by the servant of the Lord that the presentation of the righteousness of Christ marked the beginning of the loud cry of the third angel's message would join with Revelation 18, one message, and those were printed. You know, J.H. Kellogg, we heard a wonderful presentation on the medical ministry. Kellogg was, among others, um, was converted at Minneapolis. Ellen White said that he was converted, and we knew he was converted. But for some like him, the conversion was short-lived. He was soon found fighting against Jones and Wagner in the loud cry message. Um, and then, of course, they themselves had uh, issues. But she, she went on to say that even if the majority of people or the ministers would reject this, she, she said this, that uh, the people would have a chance. Now, this is the last minister's meeting we will have unless you wish to meet together yourselves. That is, she said, I'm done. If the ministers will not receive the light, I want to give the people a chance. Perhaps they may receive it. And in truth, um, that's largely been the experience since 1888. Um, There were meetings in Battle Creek in November and December. 
Uh, the first breakthrough was in January of 1889. The message was taken to South Lancaster, Massachusetts, to a college campus where young people caught the message. There was a revival, um, and you can read about those elsewhere. But there are places where this fire that still burns in your heart was passed forward. Well, here's how the story in Ezekiel 16 ends after this terrible excursus um, of the bride from the bridegroom. This rebellion, this um, terrible story. He says this, For thus says the Lord God, I will deal with you as you have done, who despise the oath by breaking the covenant. There are consequences. And we are, have, and are, we have experienced and are experiencing them. Nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth. And I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. Amen. Then you will remember your ways and be ashamed when you receive your older and your younger sisters, for I will give them to you for daughters, but not because of my covenant with you. Maybe somebody can exegete that for us. Maybe it's some of those other churches that we think are out there. And I will establish my covenant with you. Then you shall know that I am the Lord, that you may remember and be ashamed and never open your mouth anymore because of your shame. When I provide you an atonement for all you have done, says the Lord God. Yeah, there's a cosmic atonement going on now. I'm wondering if some of that includes something for the bride. I think maybe so. God is so merciful in spite of how we treated him in, in this 1888 era and how we continue to treat him as we build walls and hold him away. He's still promising to establish his covenant with us. He never, his mercy never fails. But the glory of man goes in the dust. There's glory in being ashamed of what we've done. The promise of the bridegroom, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. In the King James, that word is not dine, it is sup. Where else do you see that word? Yeah. Heard a wonderful sermon by Don McIntosh on that. That the last part of the Laodicean message is a call to sup. And that's to look at the cross. Jesus' sacrifice for us. To contemplate and take in the body and blood of Christ who was sacrificed for us. Have an intelligent, experiential understanding of the cross of Christ. Well, we'll close with this. The third angel's message is swelling into a loud cry, and you must not feel at liberty to neglect the present duty and still entertain the idea that at some future time you will be the recipients of a great blessing. When without any effort on your part, a wonderful revival will take place. Today, you are to give yourselves to God, that he may make of you vessels unto honor and meet for his service. Today, you are to give yourself to God, that you may be emptied of self, emptied of envy, jealousy, evil surmising, strife, everything that shall be dishonoring to God. Today, you are to have your vessel purified, that it may be ready for the heavenly dew, ready for the showers of the latter rain. For the latter rain will come, and the blessing of God will fill every soul that is purified from every defilement. It is our work today to yield our souls to Christ, that we may be fitted for the time of refreshing from the presence of the Lord, fitted for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Will we yield to the heavenly bridegroom now and let him complete his work? How many would like to do that? Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for sending Jesus, the heavenly bridegroom. Thank you for your great mercy in sending this precious message. Thank you for your abounding grace in promising to renew the covenant after we've broken it. We pray that you will cleanse us from every defilement, will prepare us for a fuller infilling of the Holy Spirit and laterine power that we might participate in the loud cry message 
and not repeat the mistakes of our forebears upon whom you've had great mercy. Forgive us for our um, unbelief, help our unbelief. And we pray that you will today send your Holy Spirit again. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.